The double pendulum is actually really cool, and we'll see why I think so in a little bit. But first, let's just analyze the system. So we have some pivot point from which hangs the first pendulum. It's got length L1. The bob has mass. I'm going to draw this in a place where I won't regret it later. M1. And we will find phi1 is the angle that it makes. And then the second bob hangs at some different thing. We will define phi2 as its angle relative to the vertical. This length here is L2. This mass here is M2. Okay, and now to analyze this, we're going to have to do potentials and kinetic energies. For kinetic energies, we're going to need velocity. So V1 is actually not very hard. The speed of this guy is just going to be L1 phi 1 dot, right? That's all there is to that one. The speed of the second one is really hard. So I'm going to break it down, and we're going to start with that, which I'm going to call V2 prime. V2 prime is the speed of or the velocity, really, uh, V2 prime is the velocity of the second bob relative to the first bob. So that's as if the first bob were fixed. What would V2 prime be? So V2 prime is easy to write down also, at least the magnitude of it. We'll worry about the directions in a little bit. Actually, we won't worry about the directions. Maybe we will. We'll find out. Um, but its magnitude is just L2 phi 2 dot, right? That would be if it was a pendulum all by itself. But the actual V2 that we need is equal to, um, well, well, I'll write it down, L2 phi du dot in whatever direction it's going, plus V1. Now, that's a vector sum. You can't just add the speeds. It's a vector sum, right? Because V1 is something like that, right? So I'm going to draw it down here. You have V2 prime that way. And then V1, which was like in that direction, and then this vector sum is V2, right? That's V2 prime. This is V1. And then this angle here, what is that angle? Well, that's going to be the same as this angle, right? Because it's just where I copied the thing. I don't want to call it phi. Let's call it alpha. What is alpha? Um, well, you should be able to convince yourself right, because V1 is perpendicular to the first length and V2 is perpendicular to the second length that alpha is just equal to v phi2 minus phi1. And so then this angle is pi minus phi2 minus phi1, right, because it's, uh, it's the 180 degree and so this angle plus this angle equals pi, 180 degrees. And now we can use the law of cosines to get the magnitude of V2. So V2 squared is going to equal V1 squared plus V2 prime squared minus 2 V1 V2 prime cosine of the angle between them, pi minus phi 2 minus phi 1, with all the parentheses in the right place. And, you know, the neat thing about this is that just, you know, doing the geometry, we worked out the magnitudes. That's all we need, right? We're going to do a Lagrangian, and this is the thing that's going to show up in the kinetic energy. So that's what we need. One other thing I'm going to do, you may realize that this is the same as minus cosine phi 2 minus phi 1, right? Just draw the pictures and figure it out or do the add angle formulas. You can prove that to yourself, but that is true. So now that we have V2, um, we have V1, we have enough to write down the kinetic energy, right? So we had just to Remind ourselves V1 was L1 phi 1 dot, and V2 squared, I'll just go straight with the squared, is um, L1 squared phi 1 dot squared, that's V1 squared plus V2 prime squared, L2 squared phi 2 dot squared, plus 2 V1 V2, so that's 2 L1 L2 phi 1 dot phi 2 dot, and not exactly the same order, times the cosine of phi 2 minus phi 1. And so now the kinetic energy is just 1 half times M1, L1 squared, phi 1 dot squared, plus 1 half M2 times L1 squared, phi 1 dot squared, right? If we stopped there, it would look like it was just a single pendulum with the two masses together, but there's more, plus 1 half M2, L2 squared, phi 2 dot squared plus um, m2 
times L1, L2, this was a 2 up here, phi 1 dot phi 2 dot cosine phi 2 minus phi 1. And we have the kinetic energy. Next, we need the potential energy. I'm going to do the potential energy relative to the pivot point. So um, if you look, the way I define the thetas, the potential energy of the first guy is just going to be m1g times how far is it down from the pivot point. That's just going to be L1 cosine phi 1. And then for number 2, it's going to be m2g. How far is it down? Well, it's another L2 cosine phi 2 below L1. So this is going to be L1 cosine phi 1 plus L2 cosine phi 2. Right, so that's the potential energy relative to the pivot point. And now we have the Lagrangian is T minus U as usual. And <clears throat> so given this, we can work out our equations of motion. So let's do that. So let's go ahead and make the small angle approximation. So phi 1 and phi 2 are both going to be small. This also means phi 1 dot and phi 2 dot are both going to be small. That's not immediately obvious. But um, because, right, first of all, it's not in the same units as phi 1 and phi 2. So what does small even mean? Well, there is, however, going to be a characteristic time scale of the system. Those time scales are going to be the periods associated with the normal modes, right? And so if, um, if you use that time scale as your time unit, you can then compare phi dot to phi meaningfully. Um, and it will turn out that when phi is small, phi dot is small effectively too. So what I'm going to do is keep only terms... to second order, right? Um, second order in phi 1, phi 2, phi 1 dot, phi 2 dot, which means anything cubed or higher goes away. It turns out if I didn't keep terms to second order, I'd end up with 0 equals 0, and it would be very boring. So I do have to keep terms to second order. Now, remember that the cosine of x to second order is approximately 1 minus x squared over 2, right? So if you look at the uh, kinetic energy, the first three terms are not modified at all um, because we'll have it 1 half m1. In fact, I'm going to combine these two together, m1 plus m2, l1 phi 1 um, dot squared. It's already to second order, so it's just going to sit there. And then the second term, well, which used to be the third term, 1 half m2, l2 phi 2 dot squared. It's already to second order. It's going to sit there. And then we're going to have, and here's what we're going to do. We're going to have a... 2, L1, L2, phi 1 dot, phi 2 dot. We're going to multiply this by the cosine. But notice, I'm already to second order. So I don't want to keep anything beyond the 1 in the cosine, because that'll bring me to higher order. So we're done, right? The kinetic energy is now that. It's a lot nicer. And so then for the potential energy, now we do have to expand the cosine here, because otherwise we'd end up with a constant potential energy. So that's going to come out to m1 g l1, and we expand the cosine to 1 minus phi 1 squared over 2. And then we're going to have minus m2 g l1 times 1 minus phi 1 squared over 2 for that cosine, and l2 times 1 minus phi 2 squared over 2 for that cosine. Uh, that was squared was there. Okay, and so that's the potential energy, which you uh, could simplify a little bit if you wanted. In fact, I'm going to, um, because there's a whole bunch of constants out here. I'm going to collect all the constants out front. So we're going to have an m1 plus m2 times gl1. And why the constants? Because when you take derivatives of the potential energy, they go away, so we don't care. m2 gl2. Um, those are out front, and then we'll have a plus m1 plus m2 times gl1 phi 1 squared over 2. And so these last two terms are the only ones we really care about. Plus m2 gl2 phi 2 squared over 2. And they're pluses because was, it was a minus minus thing. All right, so we'll use that actually as the potential energy because it'll be easier to look at and take derivatives of. So now that we have those, um, we can go ahead and um, write our Lagrangian as T minus U in big red things elsewhere on the page. And let's get the Euler-Lagrange equations of motion out. All right, so let's start with uh, phi 1 dot. 
partial L partial phi 1 dot is actually not so bad. Um, we're going to get a M1 plus M2 L1 squared phi 1 dot, right? So there was a 1 half before and it was phi 1 dot squared. So when you take the derivative, the 2 comes down, so on and so forth. And then the other term is just going to be M2 L1 L2 phi 2 dot, right? Because it was that term times phi 1 dot. And so the derivative is really easy. So that wasn't so bad. And now the time derivative of this is the nicest possible time derivative of anything ab above a constant. Because notice, I've got constants times a a single uh, first derivative. So all the first derivatives become second derivative, and that's all there is to it. right? It's m1 plus m2 l1 squared phi1 double dot. right? That was so nice. If only all derivatives were that easy, l1, l2, phi2 double dot. right? And then finally, partial l, partial phi, and this is where if we had done the first thing, it would have had trigs and stuff all over the place. Um, there would have been a thing in the kinetic energy that you had to remember. Um, but now there's just... Uh, and this is partial L partial phi 1. I've been doing phi 1 all this time. Now there's just the um, single term with the squared in it. Um, and so that's just going to become M1 plus M2 times GL1 phi 1. Right? And so then our um, Euler-Lagrange equation is going to be, um, and in fact, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to solve it for phi 1 double dot which means I'm going to divide both sides. So I'm going to, what I'll do is I'll put the phi 1 double dot on the left. I'll subtract this term out um, onto the right side. So it'll subtract off the left side. I'm going to divide both sides by M1 plus M2 L double dot for aesthetic reasons, because I think it looks nice to have phi 1 double dot all by itself. Although we won't actually be done, but whatever. Done is kind of a nice relative thing. So um, I'm going to have G over L1, and here's the aesthetic reason right there. If I stopped there, that's just the pendulum equation that we that you would get for a regular simple pendulum. So it looks kind of nice like that. But then we have this second term, which is going to be minus um, m2. I'm trying to take uh, m1 plus m2. I'm trying to divide in my head, which means I'm probably doing it wrong. Why don't I actually look at my notes and see if I'm doing this right? Um, yes, I did. And now there was an L2 on the top. L1 squared will cancel the L1 on the top, but there's still an L1 left in the bottom. Phi 2 double dot. Now, let's think about this from a, you know, let's think about it. What, what's the physical interpretation of this? And if you think about this pendulum, you have phi 1 here, and it's swinging around, and there's some tension holding it there. Also, this guy's swinging around, and there's some tension pulling it there, which will be the same as the tension pulling this guy up. The tension pulling this guy up is going to have to be related to the rate of acceleration of this guy um, because it's the thing keeping it moving in a circle. And so it's not surprising that phi 1 double dot has a term related to phi 2 double dot in it. And that's what this second term over here comes from. Now, this, <clears throat> I'm going to use this, but this is not the thing you'd want to do if numerically solving because you want to get phi 1 double dot in terms of phi 1, phi 1 dot, phi 2, phi 2 dot. I still have it in terms of phi 2 double dot. So I'd have to do more algebra once I get the phi 2 double dot equation um, to get it to the form I really wanted, but I'm not going to bother, and we'll see why. So let's just do phi 2 now. So remember this. Memorize this right now. We're going to pull it back out later. All right. So if we perform the same exercise, partial L by partial phi 2 dot um, is not the worst thing in the world. There's going to be an M2. L2 squared phi 2 dot plus M2 L1 L2 phi 1 dot. And once again, really easy to do the time derivative because you just add dots where there already are dots because everything else is a constant. So M2 L2 squared phi 2 double dot plus M2 L1 L2 phi 1 double dot. That was nice. And then finally, the partial derivative of L with respect to phi 2. Um, also, not so terrible to do. We're just going to end up with an M2 G L2 phi 2. And um, we'll set these two things equal to each other for the Euler Lagrange. Once again, I'm going to subtract this term from both sides, divide both sides by M2 L2 squared. We will get phi 2 double dot is equal to, and here we go. Once again, we have a term that looks just like the simple pendulum. Uh, right, so there's that, that. And then the second term we're going to have 
is going to be just L1 over L2, phi 1 double dot, because the M2s fully cancel each other out. And so, again, phi 2 double dot has a phi 1 double dot term in it um, because tensions and accelerations and blah, 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 whatever. It works out. So here's our second. So now that we have these two equations, one thing you could do is just do the algebra. Not so terrible. It's doable um, to solve it for phi 1 double dot and phi 2 double dot in terms of not each other. And then you'll get uh, equations. And it turns out they won't depend on the phi 1 dot or phi 2 dot because they're nowhere in there. Um, and you'll have something you could do numerically, but we don't want to do this numerically. We want to do this analytically. And what I want you to notice is that if you take these two equations, okay, and what I did here is I um, moved all the, I, I added stuff back onto the other side again. So I sort of undid a subtraction I did earlier. So that had all the double dots on one side. Um, by the way, I wrote it slightly wrong because this should have been a phi two double dot there. We go. Um, I could write this um, in matrix form by taking this. And what I want to do is I want to get, for the first thing, I want to get the coefficients on phi 1 double dot and phi 2 double dot. So that's going to be 1. That's going to be M2 L2 over M1 plus M2 L1. All right. And then on the other ones, I'm just going to have L1 over L2 and 1 times phi 1 double dot, phi 2 double dot. So if I do that matrix multiplication, the two rows of the resultant matrix are going to be the left sides of these equations above. And then the right side is easier because it's just G over L1, 0, 0, G over L2 times phi 1, phi 2. And so now we have this in the form M matrix times phi vector double dot, whereby phi vector, I mean a column vector that's phi 1, phi 2, to just collect the two together, um, is equal to K matrix times phi vector, which is the form we had before. But here, notice the thing that's showing up as the M matrix is no longer diagonal. And also, this is not exactly the one uh, Taylor did, because he actually multiplied both sides of its equations by some constants. But this mat these matrices are equivalent to the ones he had. So they work just as well. Right. And now, OK, so, so hold on to this thought. And we're going to try solutions, as always, in the form phi 1 is alpha 1 e to the i omega t. And now, one of the things, I don't know if I was clear about this last time. I'm going to do this a little differently this time. Um, I, had the, I had the deltas last time around. And then the idea was is that the constants out front would be real constants. You still would have real and imaginary terms that would show up in front of both sines and cosines. And you just keep the real part for your solution. Um, the sines and cosines. So here, instead of having deltas, I'll let alpha 1 and alpha 2 potentially be complex. It amounts to the same thing, right? Because um, e to the i delta is itself a complex number with a real and imaginary part. And that's part of the coefficient. So it amounts to the same thing, alpha 1 and alpha 2. And then the actual solutions will be the real parts of this. Um, but we're going to keep the full complex for now because for all the reasons we talked about before, exponentials are easier to deal with, right? In particular, phi 1 double dot is equal to minus omega squared alpha 1 e to the i omega t. That was kind of spastic, i omega t. And phi 2 double dot is equal to minus omega squared alpha 2 e to the i omega t. And what that means is, and I'm going to now modify in place, so just be prepared for this. Um, this matrix down below, I could replace this with um, I need a pen to draw with, with alpha 1, alpha 2. If I put a minus omega squared out front, and also somewhere, and I'm going to just kind of squeeze it in here, I multiply e by e today, I omega t. And then I have to do the same thing on the right side, this phi 1. Oops. The, uh, by the way, the, um, the, e to the, the minus omega squared came because these were double dots in the vector over on the left side of this equation. So on the right side, there was no double dot. So this, this will just become, that was kind of a mistake. Ooh, let's see if the undo button works. Ooh, it does. That's so nice. I should use that more. Um, this will become alpha 1. Let me draw 1, please. And then alpha 2. 
over there. And then over there, we're going to have to have an e to the i omega t somewhere. Divide both sides by e to the i omega t. And now we have this matrix equation, um, which um, you could write. And let me clear up some space down here. You could write this matrix equation um, as in purple. Um, so now I'll define alpha vector as alpha 1, alpha 2. We have m matrix times alpha vector, uh, sorry, minus omega squared m matrix times alpha vector is equal to k matrix times alpha vector, right? All right, so remember these two matrices. We're going to use them later. So this is the equation we have. Um, I just um, added or subtracted the omega squared m alpha vector from both sides. Um, so I actually should have added them, right? So it should have looked like that. Um, just as before, this is not the eigenvalue equation, but it is something you could solve with a determinant. Um, and Taylor does that. I'm going to do the same thing I did last time. I'm going to pre-multiply both of these by the inverse of m. Now, why would you not want to do that? Remember, um, the inverse of m was easy uh, last time around because m was just a diagonal matrix. And so the inverse is the one over the diagonal elements. Now m is not a diagonal matrix, right? So this thing showing up as the quote unquote mass matrix, which doesn't even have units of mass, right? It has unitless. So whatever, but we're calling it m because it showed up in the same place in the equation, right? That mass matrix was just, um, it was one m2 l2 over m1 plus m2 l1 l1 over l2 1 that's going to be harder to invert because it's not just a straight up diagonal matrix um, but you know what live the dream um, now that we have this though the what we want to do this is a true eigenvalue equation oh, it's underlined, right that was the identity matrix because m to the minus 1 times m matrix multiplication is the identity matrix this is the true eigenvalue equation so if we can get the eigenvalues they will be minus omega squared. And then the eigenvectors will be complex numbers that tell us the alpha 1 and alpha 2 that go with each minus omega squared. So let's try and do that. All right, so we're getting these. I did it all on maxima. I'm not going to step through it in the lecture right here. I did that uh, previously. If you look at the... Um, first lecture from chapter 11. I go through in great detail doing this in Maxima. I will put the Maxima file online so that you can see it, um, as well as another one I'll use later. But here are the results. Um, the eigenvalues that I get, well, so for the first one, I get that um, omega squared is equal to 2 minus the square root of 2 times g over l. That was the first eigenvalue that I got. And the second one, is bigger 2 plus the square root of 2 times g over l, right? And it's kind of weird. Why is there a square root of 2 in there? I don't know if I have a real good intuition for that. But notice um, these are both some number of order 1 times the frequency of the single pendulum, right? One's a little less than 1, one's a little bigger than 1, 3.5, something like that. And then the eigenvectors that go with this were alpha 1, alpha 2. So those are the coefficients in front of the um, sinusoids. Um, 1 over root 2, and these are the normalized ones, root 2 thirds, right? And that should have been 1 over root 3 here, right? So if you take it, um, dot it with itself, you get 1. And then the eigenvector that went with omega 2 was, wow, how ugly is this? Let me fix that. Okay, less ugly. And now the one that went with this one was, again, 1 over root 3, but then minus root two-thirds. Okay, and so what this tells us is that um, uh, we, we have two solutions here. One of the solutions is going to have phi 1 is equal to some amplitude that I'm just going to call A times, and I'm going to go ahead and pick the cosine out, just assume that it starts, um, and uh, the simulations I'll show you in a little while will all start this way. It's going to start, I'm sorry, right, cosine um, omega 1, so we'll call this omega 1, and this one omega 2, right, for the two things. Um, cosine omega 1 t, and that's all there is to it. Um, and then phi 2 is going to be the square root of 2 times 
a times cosine of omega 1c, right? Because if you look at the eigenvectors, alpha 2 had to be root 2 bigger than alpha 1. And so then a is just going to be determined by the initial conditions. I already set another initial condition, which was the phase. So that is the first mode. That's the omega 1 mode. And then the omega 2 mode needs to be in a different color. Um, the omega 2 mode is going to have, once again, phi 1 um, is equal to a times cosine uh, omega 2t and phi 2 is equal to minus root 2a cosine omega 2t so they're exactly out of phase with each other right a minus cosine is the same as adding 180 degrees to the cosine so they're exactly out of phase with each other while well, when one is to the right the other is to the left and so you get this kind of back. well i'll show you in a little bit all right, so these are the normal modes we get under the assumption that uh, phi 1 was a lot less than 1. Oh, come on. Less than 1. And phi 2 was a lot less than 1, right? We made these assumptions up here, and these are the normal modes we get. So what I want to do next is actually numerically solve it and see how how big of phi's are these assumptions any good? Um, and then I'll show you what these normal modes will look like when I do that. All right, so phi 1 and phi 2, dynamic variables, say they depend on time. This is just the potential energy that I worked out before. I've just typed it in here. Um, simplify it for no adequately explained reason. All right, now I'm going to work out, I already worked out the kinetic energy. I'm going to do it in a different way here, just because in maxima it's easier. So for V1, which was the first Bob speed, um, if you draw it out, or you just take a derivative of the positions, you'll discover that the L phi 1 dot, um, the x component is cosine, the y component is plus sine. Um, so that's just what v1 as a vector is, right? And so there's v1 squared, which, ooh, that doesn't look right. But I simplify it, I get L1 dot phi 1 dot squared. That's v1. Okay, v2 is v1, and then here is v2 prime. So this is the vector velocity of the second bob relative to the first bob. So again, it's going to be an L2, phi 2 dot, the x has a cosine, the y has a sine. So there's that. It's longer. If I do v2 dot v2, well, it's kind of longer. Um, now, this is not a vector. Notice there's, this is not one parentheses, and there's a plus here. So that's because it's a dot product, right? And then if I do, and I played with this a little bit to figure out that trig simp times trig reduce um, gives me what I want here. Um, and so... If you look at this and compare it to what Taylor uses, it's basically the same thing. It's also what I had before, right? I had the 2 L1, L2, phi 1 dot, phi 2 dot, cosine of the difference, okay? And so then here is my kinetic energy term, same thing as I had before. Um, let's try simplifying it. I don't know if that's better, but there it is. And so now I have T and U. I can get my Lagrangian, and there is the Lagrangian. And so f to deal with the Lagrangian, I'm going to get the Euler-Lagrange equations out. So here's the first one. Remember, the Euler-Lagrange equation is partial L, partial phi 1, minus the time derivative. So that's this outer derivative. So inside it, we have partial L, partial phi dot, and then phi dot is um, the derivative of phi 1 with respect to time. So this diff of L, comma diff phi 1, comma t, that's partial L, partial phi dot, Right, so that's the first thing, and then comma t. So that's that time derivative. That's the first Euler-Lagrange equation, and it gives us this big unholy mess. And I'm not really sure what to make of this negative negative out front. Um, and there's another bad thing that's going to happen later that I'll show you. Um, same thing. So partial l, f partial phi two minus d by dt of partial l partial phi two dot is zero and burp, and there it is. And now. What I'm going to do, I have my two equations. I'm going to solve them because I'm doing this numerically. So I need to solve them for phi 1 double dot. So that's diff phi 1 comma t comma 2 and phi 2 double dot. I do those solutions. And here's the thing that bothers me about this. Um, you will notice, uh, let's look at the phi 2 solution here, right? So here's the phi 2 thing. Notice at the end, there. this is a, a divided by and there's a bunch of terms after this. And if you look at this, there's no closed parentheses out here, right? So this is an L2 M1. So that's going to have units of meters times kilograms, which is really not the unit of this. Something is going wrong. Here's the mistake. And I actually did this with console maxima, and maxima did it right. So this is a bug in WX maxima. There should be an open parenthesis there 
and a closed parenthesis there. And I discovered this when I cut and paste into um, my numerical solution and things went completely haywire. So, and there's the same problem in the first thing. Let's see if I can find it. Yeah, there should be an open parenthesis here and a closed parenthesis here. Um, and even if you cut and paste, they're missing. So be warned, um, WX Maxima makes errors with parentheses and it's very irritating. But I, so what I ended up doing is using console maxima, which got it right. Anyway, so except for those missing parentheses, so this is actually, this is wrong, but the missing parentheses would be right. We have the solutions um, and let's simplify them up a bit. Um, I don't know, at this point, maybe the parentheses aren't missing. No, they still are because I still have unit problems. In fact, I suspect this one is just straight up wrong. Let's just blow that away. I suspect that's straight up wrong because the parentheses are missing. But anyway, so this gives me my solutions. You see why Taylor said solving this wouldn't provide a whole lot of insight, right? It's just, it's not awful. We've seen things this bad before. Um, we've seen things a lot worse than this before, but yeah, it's kind of long. So now that I have these two equations for phi one double dot and phi two double dot, um, and notice phi one double dot depends on phi one dot phi two dot, uh, phi two and phi one. So they depend on everything. And in fact, if you're worried, it says, wait a minute, this is a conservative system, right? Um, there's, there's no energy losses in this system. So why is it depending on phi one dot and phi two dot? Isn't that usually what damping terms have? And yes, it is true, damping terms. So if you have the one dimensional damped harmonic oscillator, you have a X dot term that is the damping term. So where the hell did these come from? Where the hell these came from? As remember, phi two is a variable that's in an accelerated frame, right? Phi two is, I mean, I guess, I don't know. And anyway, the position of Bob two, the way we did it with its velocity on phi two, that velocity was in an accelerated frame. And so you have effectively frame transformation stuff that comes into it. Um, another way of looking at this is you could say, well, there's gonna be centrifugal forces pulling out. Really, it's the tension force of the rod, but where does that tension come from? Well, it's holding phi 2 in place. So in the frame of reference where phi 2 is at rest, it's it's countering a centrifugal force. Um, and, and then you know that those kinds of things depend on phi dot. So it will turn out the energy is conserved in this system, even though the phi double dots depend on the phi dots. Um, but they it works out happily so that it works okay. So there we have those. Okay, so now I'm going to plot it, and I'm going to start by um, plotting the solutions of those those whole long messy solutions I had. I'm going to start with an initial conditions of phi one of pi over ten, right? So is phi one small? Well, 0.3. is that small? I don't know. We'll find out. It turns out it's small. Um, phi one of pi over ten. So that's a that's a nice small angle, right? What is that? Um, it's like uh, so pi over two is ninety degrees, and if I divide by five. It's like 20 degrees, less than 20 degrees, something like that. Pretty small angle. We could do smaller, but this is fine. Um, pi over 10, and then phi 2, I'm going to start a factor of root 2 bigger and positive. So I'm going after the first normal mode, right? I'm starting with initial conditions that would match that a cosine omega t and root 2a cosine omega t. Um, and so let's see what that looks like. And as you watch, you see the thing and notice the... One on the bottom does make a steeper angle than the one on the top. It's not completely a straight line, but look, the two things are in phase with each other. And when you see the plots at the end here, I'm dragging the, oh, yes. When you see the plots at the end thing here, you can see that they both make really nice sine waves. Um, and if you look at the phases of the waves, they're nicely lined up with each other. That's great. And let's look at the other normal mode. So to start this, once again, I started at um, omega one at pi over 10. And this time I started omega 2, or not omega 1, I started phi 1 at pi over 10. I started phi 2 at negative root 2 times pi over 10. So this should be going after that second normal mode in the linear case. Now, I'm solving the nonlinear equation. Um, so what that the fact that we got the first normal mode says, oh, so pi over 10 is a small enough angle to count as small. So let's look at this one, All right? And there it is. It's oscillating faster. And you remember the omega of this was faster. And it's, it's just nicely staying. So that's the second normal mode. And we'll get the plot up here, and you can look at the plot. And if you look, you'll notice the phase. They're out of phase now, phi 1 and phi 2 on the top, out of phase with each other. And you can see that in the 10 seconds of the solution, we fit more oscillations. So it's a that was the faster period. Well, OK. Um, but part of what I wanted to do is what happens when you get to um, bigger things. So let's go ahead and make it 
bigger and see what we get. Um, so the next thing I did, um, I went from pi over 10 to pi over 5. Whoa, living on the, living on the edge, right? Because pi over 5 is um, 3 fifths, right? Uh, divided by 10, 0.3 fifths, 0.6, something like that. Um, so here's what it looks like when you do pi over 5. Um, and then that was the phi 1 was pi over 5. Phi 2, I had root 2 bigger. I'm just going to look at the equivalent of the normal mode thing. So when you do pi over 5, okay, you can see there's a little wiggling going on here, that the perfectly in phase with each other is not there, but pretty much it's still mostly doing the same thing, right? And so when you look at the sine wave, you look at the plot at the end here, you can see that it's not a perfect sine wave. In fact, look at the d phi 1 dt at the bottom. You can see there's little extra wiggles in there. It's still periodic. And the normal mode was an approximation. The normal mode from the linearized equations, oh, as an aside, um, that stuff we did with the normal modes and that Taylor does, um, I said I linearized it. Now, the Lagrangian had terms in terms of phi 1 squared and phi 2 squared and phi 1 dot squared. So that's not linear. Right? That's parabolic. Why do I call that linear? But remember, the phi 1 and phi 2 double dot equations we got out depended only on phi 1 to the first and phi 2 to the first. So that's why we say they're linear. So when we made the small angle approximation, we linearized it. And so then we got the normal modes out of the linearized thing. And hey, guess what? If you're going to use linear algebra to do stuff, you need linear equations. Um, OK, so um, with pi over 5, the approximation is yeah, sort of good. It kind of gets it right. But you see there's little extra wiggles on it. So let's go up to one full on radian, right? Live the dream. So this is what happens when I go to one radian. Is one a lot less than one? You decide. And now, right, it's swinging more. And you can see that the deviations from the two being exactly in phase are bigger than they used to be. Um, qualitatively, it's still like one's going to the right, then the other's going to the right, and one's going to the left. But there's lots of little extra wiggles kind of on top of that going on here. And I actually let this one go for 30 seconds because I want to show you something in the motion at the end. Right, so let's look at the graphs at the end. And yes, you can see they're up and down. Look at the d phi 1 dt graph. It's kind of spastic. But look at the phi 2 graph over on the right. And you notice you've got these little sort of um, pointy offset asymmetric pointy things going on. And there's one with the pointy to the left and pointy to the right, pointy to the left. And it actually looks periodic. It looks like there's some longer period whereby which the whole kind of spastic thing repeats itself. So, and I haven't actually really done an analysis of this. And... Um, tell you what I'm thinking in a moment. Uh, but it, I think that motion is actually still periodic. It's just that you've got more modes in there than just the two normal modes from the linear solution. And you have some longer period going on. Kind of interesting. All right. Well, one radian. Let's go to 1.1 radians and see what happens. All right. And now you can tell just looking at it, the deviations are bigger, but just watch. Right. Notice the second bob's getting sort of inverted up, get pushed all the way up there. Oh, and the first one went high. Yeah, it's kind of all over the place now. Right, it almost folded up there. All right. So and if you look at this one, I would have to go longer to decide if there's periodicity or not. But you, in the first 30 seconds, you don't see any periodicity, right? Um, this thing is a... Um, is much more tangled now. And then finally, I want to do 1.4 radians. So that this starts really big. And watch this guy go. Whoop. The bottom one made a circle all the way around there, right? Oh, there's another one. Yeah, so you start with enough energy in the system, and this thing can start spinning around and all of that. This is a chaotic system. Now, you don't get chaotic systems unless you have nonlinear terms. And sadly, because of the whole virus thing, we had to eliminate the whole chaos discussion from the uh, uh, from the course. Right. So notice phi 2 on the right here um, goes way down below minus 2 pi. And that's because it made circles all the way around there. You see that going on. And, and the amplitudes or the 
the orbits, the uh, motion of the thing is, is very spastic. Um, so th this is a chaotic system. The motion there will never period, it will never repeat itself. It doesn't have a period the way I think, I'm not completely sure, but I think the one radian one um, is periodic, that eventually the motion will go back and repeat itself. The chaotic one never repeats itself. It just stay, and this is why it's called chaotic. Um, the nonlinear behavior will means it will just be kind of all over the place. Now there's weird hidden structure inside chaos. I really wish we had time to talk about this. Um, so you see that. Well, I want to show you one more feature of chaos. And what I'm going to do this time, I have two solutions. On the left, um, I have exactly the solution I just showed you. And then on the right, I have almost exactly the solution I just showed you. But instead of starting phi zero at 1.4 radians, I started at 1.4001 radians, right? It is um, one one thousandth, a little less than one, sorry, one ten thousandth. It's a little less than one ten thousandth different, um, relatively speaking. And uh, what we're going to do now is set both of these going and watch. Watch what happens as I set both of these going. Right? So initially, unsurprisingly, the two seem to nicely line up with each other, as you'd kind of expect. But watch as time goes on. Oh, OK, it flipped around, but both of them did. But notice they're not lined up anymore. In fact, right, they're almost completely out of phase. They completely diverged in their motion there. So this is another feature of chaos, is extreme sensitivity to initial conditions. Um, this is the, the butterfly effect that you may have heard of. You change the initial conditions at just a tiny amount, and at some point down the line, the behavior of the system will be completely different. So we saw, I changed the initial conditions by a factor of one ten thousandth. And in about 10 or 20 seconds, the two guys were completely in different directions. Now, sometimes the butterfly effect is misinterpreted. Here it's often stated as um, if a butterfly in Brazil flaps its wings left instead of right, it can cause a hurricane in Florida five weeks later, which then makes people think, wow, butterflies are powerful. Um, we know they're yummy, but uh, are they powerful? No, they're not. It's not that the butterfly flapped its wings and summoned a hurricane. Hurricanes happen anyway. Um, the system will not, because of some small change, will not behave in a way it wouldn't have behaved. You notice those pendulums, both of them were doing the kinds of things that this pendulum does. The details are what changes. So Florida, Florida gets hurricanes, right? All the time, happens all the time. Exactly when they hit though, uh, is really hard to predict because the weather is a chaotic system. And very, very small changes in initial conditions can change how the system behaves down the line. So it's not that it summons a hurricane. It's just hurricanes happen in Florida. Is it going to happen this week or in two weeks? That kind of thing can change. Just like was the pendulum swung all the way to the left or all the way to the right at t equals 25 seconds? It was different when I changed the initial conditions by one part in 10,000. And it turns out when you analyze chaos, this goes all the way down. An arbitrarily small but non-zero change in the initial conditions will eventually correspond to a big change in the later system behavior. Again, it won't be the kind of things this is, you wouldn't expect the system to do, but exactly where is it its phase, exactly what's going on can be quite different. Um, also, gravitational systems are chaotic because the one over R squared, they have nonlinear terms and what's going on, which means our solar system is not 100% stable. <laughs> All the planets, stable enough, don't worry about it, except for this little guy that's not even a planet named Pluto. Um, I did some simulations a few years ago over the summer, and in the versions of the simulations I had, Pluto got kicked out of the solar system in about 80 or 90 million years from now. Um, where Pluto is in its orbit, resonances with Neptune, means it's actually probably not completely, it's in a nice stable resonance with Neptune, but small perturbations from the gravity of the other planets eventually can cause it to change and get kicked out of the solar system. Chaos. Anyway, so all of that was the double pendulum. I think the double pendulum is really cool because of the thing we saw at the end where you start with two things that are almost exactly the same initial condition and they go wildly off on different behavior later on. That's all. I will have another video later, I think, about weekly coupled oscillators, but I'm going to have to record that video once every seven days, so it'll take a while to come out.